my daughter, she uh, she's ten now, but when she was little, she um, she was very fussy eater, and um, and you'd put something like broccoli on her plate, and she, at two years old, she'd grab it, fling it across the room, and say, "Disgusting!" Now. That's fine, you know, that's on the floor now. Um, three second rule, I'll put it in my mouth or it goes in the bin. But I can risk that, right? I can take those risks. I can try a different type of veg. Turns out she loves cauliflower, hates broccoli, right? So I just put broccoli, uh, cauliflower on her plate all the time and she'll eat that. But if you don't have the financial capacity to keep experimenting, there is this, this there is evidence base that says you have to try something new like six times before your, your palate adjusts to a new taste or texture. You need to, there's a certain threshold point that they get to after being exposed to it for a certain amount of time. The vouchers give you the ability to keep experimenting with your kids, keep trying something new out. Because the sad thing is, is that it probably doesn't take six times for you to bite into a chicken nugget and go, I like that, mm. right? So you've done it once, you liked it, and the mum goes or the dad goes, you know what? I know they like it. I know they'll eat it all. There won't be any food waste. They'll turn around to me and say, dad, thanks. That was delicious. And as a parent, that's all you want, right? Mm, that's all you yeah. want. You want that reaction and you want your kids to be full, satiated and happy. And so that becomes the easy option. And it's, again, going back to what we've said so many times, it's pretty cheap. Doctor's Kitchen. Recipes, health, lifestyle. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for making the time to jump on the pod today. Super, super stoked that you can make it. Um, why don't we start with... The charity, because I was just saying before we got started here, I hadn't come across the charity before. Uh, so do you want to give us a little intro into into the, the background of the charity and then we can talk specifically about this wonderful uh, study that you guys are, uh, are doing? Thanks, Rupert. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I quite often say to people, we're, uh, we're, we're like a charity startup, um, uh, albeit one with 110 years of history and a royal patron. So um, the history goes back quite some time, but the work that we're doing currently is is brand new and we think really innovative. Um, uh, the history of the charity is it's actually a royal charity. It was connected to the royal family because it was founded by um, Queen Alexandra in t 1912. Um, and at, at the time it was set up to um, support access to healthcare for people in London, um, particularly before the NHS, um, actual ac access to healthcare was a real challenge for people living in poverty. And so they set up a fundraising drive to support access to better, better medical attention and care. Uh, and the charity went along very successfully until uh, 1948 when the NHS was developed. Um, and then it turned its attention. It had this huge fundraising mechanism and it said decided that it would continue raising funds and distribute it to small charities across the UK. And that went on very well for, for many, many years. Um, and the charity, you, you know, used to have quite a high profile, especially in the 50s and 60s. But it sort of went into a, a slow and long decline, I would say, um, as uh, the development of sort of single issue charities grew in the 80s and 90s, you know, uh, it, it found it difficult to sort of really categorize what it, what it was about and what it stood for. So in around about 2012, the charity decided to, um, you know, circle the wagons and go, well, do we either wind the charity up or do we look for a new mission? And they asked themselves, what's the equivalent uh, dynamic to what was happening in 1912 that Queen Alexandra saw? What was the equivalent dynamic today? And they came to the conclusion that the sort of confluence, if you like, between uh, diet related ill health and food insecurity or food poverty in the United Kingdom. And the fact that you can be in a situation where you're sometimes skipping meals just to make sure that your kids can eat. Um, mm. uh, but at the same time, you might be suffering from diet related ill health, where, whereby it might be type two diabetes, it might be overweight or obesity, cardiovascular disease, all of these things associated with bad diet. But so because when you're when you you don't have enough food quite often but when you do have food the kind of food that you have access to isn't necessarily great for your health and well-being and so they said well what can we do in this space that's not being done um currently and we looked uh, to the united states uh 
where there was some similar work going on where they'd come up with an idea of doubling the value of people's food stamps. And the food stamps is a huge part of the welfare system in the United States. Around about a third of families and, and individuals are in receipt of food stamps, but they're not always being spent on the healthiest of food. Uh, so they said, how can we incentivize you know, more consumption of fresh fruit and veg? What, what if we doubled the value of these vouchers of these food stamps um, and and but to incentivize it, we said you can spend it on fresh fruit and veg from local markets. And we thought that was a really great concept and we wondered if it could be brought here to the to the UK. And that's sort of where it all started. And around about 2014, the charity did its first pilots, a very small intervention in Hackney. And the only equivalent that we have to food stamps in the UK is a program called Healthy Start. So Healthy Start is a government mm -hmm. program for pregnant women and um, families with children under the age of four. And it's all about prioritizing good nutrition within the first four years of a, of a child's life, because that's actually the most crucial point in their development. So we know and there's a huge evidence base that if you uh, uh, that the first 1001 days of a child's life has a critical importance and critical impact on their future life chances. And that's from everything around socialization, education, but food and nutrition is really important. And we are already seeing that, you know, in the statistics out there around about 20 percent of kids arriving at school in reception, either overweight and obese. So the problem has started within those that early year setting. Uh, and so we decided, why don't we see if we match the value of um, Healthy Start vouchers with our own voucher, um, which is all about uh, access to fresh fruit and veg from local markets and independent retailers. So we did a pilot in Hackney, around about 45 families. Uh, we worked with Ridley Road Market, which is a fantastic street market in the center of Hackney. And we partnered with local children's centers these are places that are that are um, that were set up um, to to support early years development in areas where there's high levels of um, of uh, of poverty, uh, and so those centres engage the families uh, that, who might be either at risk of food insecurity or have diet related health problems. They register them on the Rose Voucher Project. Uh, and they distribute vouchers every week to those families who can take them down to the market and redeem them to, for the fresh fruit and veg that they want that's culturally appropriate for them. Uh, it gives them choice, it gives them agency, but because we're only working with market traders, they can only redeem them for fresh fruit and veg. So it's, it's, uh, it's really maximizing um, the amount of nutritious, um, healthy food that they can access. Uh, and at the same time, they, through the association with the children's centers, they're getting that sort of wraparound lifestyle support. So that might be support for breastfeeding, weaning workshops, cook and eat um, sessions, advice and guidance on a range of sort of health and well-being issues that make sure that the voucher itself is a is one mechanism, but it's the sort of holistic approach to helping them develop a healthier lifestyle that really makes the impact. And the great thing about targeting it at early years is that when with all parents, it's the same, whether you're rich or poor, um, when you become a parent, first thing is you don't really know what you're doing. So you're much more open to support and advice and guidance than you than you ever are really in your life. And you go out and seek it because you're like, my God, what am I doing here? I have no idea. And uh, and those children centers are just full of professionals who can provide you with all that advice and guidance. And when they engage you on the Rose Vouchers for Fruit and Veg project, there's a sort of this moment of going, oh, well, you know, my nutrition and my child's nutrition is important. And here's the sort of the financial incentive to be able to do something about it. Because we know that um, one of the biggest barriers to accessing a healthier diet and, and adopting a healthier lifestyle is the cost. Um, mm. Calories from unhealthy food are three times cheaper than calories from healthy food in the UK. So it's a rational economic decision when you've got very little money to spend that you spend it on calories that will easily and cheaply fill you up and give you the, the energy that you need, but they're possibly not giving you the nutritious and nutrients that you need to have a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. This is, um, Sorry, I've just, I've just rabbited on there. Haven't I? So apologies. No, no, that's great. I'm just like sat, sat here or standing here, nodding my head along thinking, a, this is amazing. This is sick. 
And B, how on earth have I not heard of you guys before since you've been running in, tw- in 2012? And, and I've, I've worked in Hackney as well. I, I've, I've been an ambassador for uh, Made in Hackney, the, um, uh, the, 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 um, the, the charity for, for years now. Uh, and, and yep. done some sort of like I'm sure you guys have probably worked together in the past. We've, we've worked with Made in Hackney on a number of occasions. A great, fantastic organisation, by the way. Really great um, people to be involved with. Um, so we're we're still kind of small. So we started with 45 families in Hackney. Uh-huh. We probably support about 250, 300 now. Um, uh, it's a it's a it's a very targeted project, um, and uh, and it's it's delivered through those partners um children center organizations so it's really about you know making sure that we engage the 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 people who can benefit most from from the program in saying that i mean we we started with that small pilot then we started getting interest from other local authorities so we rolled out into lambeth uh in 2015 uh, and then um some sort of uh, the interest sort of developed with national funders and they sort of set us the challenge, actually. They said, you know, that this is all well and good. This is a great project, has excellent impact in improving um, uh, health and well-being in early years. It's increasing consumption of fresh fruit and veg, which is an, a key indicator of improved dietary quality. Uh, but London is, you know, it's a special uh, environment. Uh, there's, you know, it's uh, it has a very diverse population, more open to fresh fruit and veg, perhaps culturally, than than um, white working class communities in the UK who have the lowest consumption of fresh fruit and veg of any population in the UK. Um, and they said, you know, how how would this work outside of the bubble of London? And and I sort of said, well, look, if you give me some money, I will go and test that for you. And uh, they were very obliging. And so we did an expression of interest uh, in 2016 uh, to see uh, if there was interest outside of the uh, out of outside of the London bubble. And uh, we had 14 cities and towns from around the country apply from as far afield as Belfast and Northern Ireland, Cardiff, Exeter, um, uh, Liverpool, Brighton, uh, and so we 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 went round and visited what we thought were the you know the top candidates, and mm-hmm. out of that we chose um, Barnsley in South Yorkshire and Liverpool. So that expansion started in 2016 outside of London. The project works really well um, in both locations. Uh, in Barnsley, they've got a fantastic um, central marketplace. I think its first deed of covenant from the king was something like 1256 or something like that. So it's been in situ in that location for over 800 years. It's unbelievable. Wow. It's a, a brilliant. And, and quite often I, t- I tell people who um, who are interested that I, I going to Barnsley Market is like going to La Boqueria in, um, in Barcelona. Uh, except instead of all the little stand-up espresso bars that you find um, scattered throughout La Boqueria, um, you've got uh, a, a cafes selling milky tea and a bacon butty instead. But, the, you know, the range and diversity of produce is, is fantastic and the vibrancy is amazing. Um, and so that was a great uh, a partnership there. Uh, but in Liverpool, the challenge was that there wasn't such a great market culture in Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a few markets, but they weren't near the populations of greatest need. Uh, and and so what's been brilliant about the project in Liverpool is that they have um, they have a, a fruit and veg bus, and it's a bus that has on on uh, inside of it has a, um, a shop. You walk into the bus and you can purchase your fruit, fresh fruit and veg. And that bus drives around to all the areas of Liverpool, some of which are, you know, like seriously are food deserts. Right. Mm. So there are these are large swathes of 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 housing, of of neighborhoods where it's physically very difficult to access fresh fruit and veg because there aren't shops. There's not supermarkets and the nearest supermarket is across you know, a very busy road. Um, you either need a car to get there, or you need to walk with your pram and your buggy a long way. So, uh, so bringing fruit and veg into those communities has been has been a, a, an amazing thing to be involved in. Um, the bus itself is is fantastic, um, and without it, you know, these communities wouldn't have that accessibility. So uh, that happened in two thousand and sixteen, seventeen. And then more recently, we've expanded in London boroughs, so Southwark, 
Hammersmith and Fulham, Tower Hamlets, and uh, and Glasgow was our last project during the pandemic. We opened up in Glasgow, so we support around about two thousand eight hundred families every week with vouchers. Uh, that that um, big um, golden sign that you can see behind me uh, is our one millionth voucher that we gave out on Hammersmith and Fulham Market uh, in September last year. Since September last year, we've done six hundred thousand vouchers. Wow. So you can sort of see that it has, it took a long time to sort of really get going and really catch on. So it took us eight years to do a million and it's taken us another year to do 600,000. So the scale of it is developing quickly. Uh, and, and so we are, we are just in this process of starting to put our head above the parapet and starting to talk more broadly about what we do. But most recently, the, the development of a new, uh, two new pilots in our work, which is uh, fruit and veg on prescription, working with local GPs and local community health practitioners, that gave us an opportunity to go out more widely to to the public and to the media to sort of to showcase um, a new and innovative approach to improving access to, to healthy food. So, uh, I think that's probably what how you heard about us is the is the press release that we put out about that piece of work. Um, that was developed in partnership with public health teams in Lambeth and in Tower Hamlets. And they both know about our work already because we do this children's centre model. But for, for, for many years, we've been aware that the voucher system that we work with early years could easily be transferable to many different groups mm -hmm. outside of that age category. So there are many people who are struggling to access a healthy diet. Um, that financial barrier is one of the key um, barriers and one of the, the 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 things that's missing most from their diet is fruit and veg, and we knew for a, a long time that we'd seen the the success of this work overseas. So again, back in the United States, they've been piloting fruit and veg on prescription since around about two thousand and fourteen, oh. uh, and uh, there's some similar work in Australia as well on a small scale. We wanted to bring that to the UK um, and been, I've been sort of touting the idea around to various people uh, and eventually um, someone took up the idea, both Tower Hamlets and, and Lambeth public health teams um, commissioned us to set up two pilots, which we have done in the last sort of uh, four or five months. Yeah, that, that's epic. I, I wanted to, I'm glad you brought up the the US as an example because I, I didn't want to gloss over this. Did, did I hear this correctly? A third of people in the United States are utilizing food stamps. Is that correct? Yes. So um, they don't call them food stamps anymore. And I would need to give you the, I, I, you know, you'd need to research the the exact um, name of it. Um, there, are, uh, It's a nutrition program. I think it's called SNAP um, okay. is the a acronym, but I can't remember what it stands for. But it's it's a nu nutrient nutritional um, program in the US. This is... I mean, you, you've got to remember the United States is a huge agricultural nation, mm. um, much bigger agricultural nation than the UK. Uh, it has one of the most subsidized food systems in the world. You know, they are all about free trade internationally, but when it comes to their food and farming sector, they are not free traders at, in, at to any stretch of the imagination. They, they subsidize their food system um, massively. Um, but what had uh, has been the case i think since the end of the second world war is that they've had these food stamps as a part of the welfare system and i think that fits in really well with the sort of american mentality which is oh we're not going to give you money um but okay we'll, we'll give you some we'll give you some uh uh, uh some st st uh, vouchers stamps that you can that you can exchange for for food because the welfare, the safety net in the U.S. is much uh, isn't as uh, as wide and supportive as it is in other Western countries, uh, and so it's always been tied to the farm bill in the U.S. in to some degree. Um, so they know that these food stamps are mainly spent on um, on U.S. agricultural products because a huge amount of the production and consumption is is uh, is home grown in the US because their agriculture sector is so big. Mm. Um, but what's exciting there is that they've seen the innovation in trying to incentivize healthier choices with these with this incentive program. And uh, they uh, have actually allocated around about 250 million US dollars to 
um, to programs similar to ours, where they are incentivizing fresh fruit and veg consumption specifically mm. um, from local distributors and local markets. So uh, I, I think that's, you know, it, it's partly to do with this very unique American dynamic around food stamps, but also partly to do with the, the people who are driving this sort of um, uh, incentivization of fruit and veg over there have been very clever. They've lobbied central government and they said, well, look, if it's been spent on fresh fruit and veg, that means it's going back into the pockets of American farmers. So why don't you give us a chunk of that money and we will distribute it to the to the populations who need it most to address not only a income inequality, but also a health inequality. And that's the key here is that it's, it, that's, you know, uh, in the past that they were giving food stamps to, to alleviate income inequality, but those food stamps were exacerbating mm. health inequality. So now they've reversed it and, and they're trying to incentivize consumption of, you know, really good, nutritious, healthy food. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, thanks for clarifying that. I think that's super important because uh, when I think about food stamps, I think about uh, essentially food banks where they just have pretty much ultra processed food that's available for people to just pick up and stuff using their vouchers. Um, just dialing into the actual vouchers that you've been piloting um, since 2014 uh, in, in Hackney. But w w what does a Rose voucher look like? How much is it for? And how do you work with the market vendors to um, to to uh, exchange them? Well, they look a little bit like this. Actually, I, I've written on this because I was writing notes to myself about something I can't remember. So oh, yeah. <laughs> excuse the writing across it. But that's that's the rose voucher for fruit uh -huh. and veg. Um, it's uh, it's very colourful. Um, you'll see, you notice that it has a, a barcode along the bottom there. So <clears throat> most traditional market traders in the UK are still cash-based economy. Mm. They, um, they, they, some of them have card machines, but many, many um, don't use card machines. It will, and predominantly, you know, the, the biggest users of cash in the UK are people in from low-income communities um, and older communities as well. And so what when we set this up, we were really aware that we didn't want to create a mechanism that changed the way that traders exchange the exchange took place on a market we wanted our families to feel confident in using their voucher and feel like they didn't stand out or they didn't delay transactions on the stand so mm -hmm. so we <clears throat> designed this in 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 consultation with um with families actually our, our trustees had some sort of much more corporate branded looking thing uh, in their in mind but when we road tested it with the families. They were like, no, we want this. We want bright colors. We want it to look lovely. Um, I quite often call this, you know, it's very quite simply, we, we've created the, the a bank of Alexander Rose charity. This is a, uh, a, um, a piece of, this is a, uh, what do you call it? It's a currency. Uh, it's a conditional currency. You can only spend this currency on fresh fruit and veg, but it is a currency and mm. you can redeem that currency at the bank of Alexander Rose charity. Um, the, uh, the vouchers, you take your vouchers to the market trader, you pick the fruit and veg that you want. They're all one pound denomination. So you can, you can shop around. You don't have to use it all at that one trader. You can go from trader to trader based on what they have best. You know, one, one might specialize in fruit, one might specialize in South Asian veg, one might have Africa and Caribbean produce. You know, you can just walk the market and choose where to spend it. But the trader takes it like cash, like any other trader, stuffs it into their uh, into the front pocket of their um, of their of their belt, their trader belt, um, and the exchange is as smooth as if you were using cash. Yeah. Then when yeah. the trader has a moment uh, of quiet on his market stand, not normally doesn't normally happen because they're very busy. So generally they take them home at the end of the day. They all have a mobile Bluetooth scanner. They can plug that into their phone, into their laptop or into their um, tablet, and they just scan the barcode, goes into our, um, we've created a digital platform, a web, web application, get, uh, all of the data goes into that. And when they've um, scanned all of the vouchers, they just 
press request payment and that sends a message to us and the most important thing about that is it doesn't slow down the um the transition of mm -hmm. cash through the business mm -hmm. because they are very hand-to-mouth businesses on a uh, in many occasions uh they um they take cash in the day they go to the market that night and buy more produce and then they come back onto the stall the following morning with that fresh produce so we needed to make sure that the that the speed of cash flow through their business wasn't interrupted. Um, and in saying that, what a, l a lot of traders have told us, and especially during COVID, because m markets were terribly disrupted during COVID, um, that they've been so used to being a cash-based economy for a long time. They would take cash in the day, they would spend it that night. And then at the end of the week, what money they had left on them, they would distribute as wages to their staff, and then and then spend and then spend the money themselves. Um, what many of them find is that they some they don't need to touch sometimes that money from the vouchers that goes into their bank account. And then they turn around at the end of a month when there's been a lot of rain or snow and the, and trade has been slower. They look in their bank account and they've got this nice cushion of of um, of income that they haven't touched, and it allows them to sort of. Uh, to ride out the vicissitudes of, of what, what trading in an open air environment is often like. Mm. Um, it can be up and down depending on the weather, interrupted by things like COVID, interrupted by, um, by, by lots of different uh, challenges that they face. So I, I always say that our theory, we have a theory of change in, in the charity. You know, we, we want everyone to, uh, we want people, uh, families on low incomes to have better health and well-being um, via access to um, nutritious fruit and veg, right? So that's one very obvious uh, end, end goal of our charity. The other end goal is that um, we believe that everyone should have access to a healthy, diverse, sustainable food economy in their local community. And, and until in the UK, until small business people can make money out of selling healthy food in low-income communities, we're, we're, we've, I'm sorry, but we're not going to get out of this hole that we've dug ourselves into. You need to have a market economy that allows people to make money from selling healthy food. Uh, and, and that's fine if you go into a middle income area of the UK, you know, there's lots of grocery stores and, mm. and, uh, and supermarkets and green grocers and farmers markets and all the, t all those types of things. But if you go to large swathes of, of, uh, of, of the UK, where, where there's large populations on with low income, the accessibility to a healthy food economy is really challenging. And actually, it's much easier to buy stuff that's pro ultra processed, packaged, high salt, saturated fats, sugars, all the things that we're told are bad for us, um, and uh, much more affordable, physically accessible than it is to buy good food, nutritious food. And we've got to change that dynamic. Mm. And so we want to see a healthy, diverse, vibrant food economy that's accessible to everyone. Yeah, yeah, and it, it it sounds like you're paving the way for that, and to demonstrate the outcomes that I, I want to dig into in a, in a second. H how much is distributed to to each family? Is it based on is it me means tested? Is it based on number of people in the household? Like, how do I know as a family how much I'm going to get in terms of the the value of the vouchers? Sure. So every um uh, uh every family on our on our early years program, uh, so we have a different uh, values between our, our fruit and veg and prescription and our early years program uh -huh. but the early years program uh, each family uh, gets four pounds of voucher um, per child uh, double if the child is under one year of age and the reason for that is that we think it's really important to support the nutritional um, uh, the nutrition of the parents in that first year because that's a really tough year um, so that focus on um, supporting in the first six months because the child's not really eating any food in the first six months is to support the parents uh, and then uh, secondly to make sure that they have a, a, a wide variety of fresh fruit and veg to wean their child off onto when when they start eating solid food from about six months onwards um, uh, we uh, if you have more than one child you'll get multiples of 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 four pounds of vouchers uh, and uh, in some areas of course, th these things um, change because of 
the nature of our funding. So some funders, uh, in some areas, our projects are, uh, have more funding than in other areas, and the funders ask us to support in different ways. So we do in Glasgow and in Southwark and Lambeth, we support eligibility for vouchers to for children who are above five as well. So that increases the amount of vouchers the family gets. Uh, uh, but um, that's only available in those areas. Sadly. Okay, so so this is uh, the, just to get my head around the scheme. This is more like a, a top up of like your weekly shopping uh, needs, whereby these vouchers are specifically uh, geared towards healthy, uh, fresh produce, uh, in addition to what you might spend in a supermarket, let's say. Yep. And so what j tends to happen is that lots of people who come onto the program weren't using the markets beforehand. Ah. Uh, and so they take the fruit and veg vouchers down to the market. They find one, you know, fruit and veg markets in the UK are the most affordable place you can buy fresh fruit and veg. Mm. There, we did a, a survey in Southwark with East Street Market and the Morrison supermarket at the bottom of the street. And um, uh, for, on like for like items, um, East Street Market was 60% cheaper than Morrison's wow. supermarket for those items. So families go, they start using the vouchers on the market stall. They realize the value for money that they get. They quite often dip their hands into their own pockets to top up their spending. And we've got evidence from, from economic impact surveys that we've done that the traders tell us that customers spend their own money and our Rose Vouch families tell us that they often spend their own money on top of the vouchers. But then they also realize that the local butcher on that um, street market is much cheaper than the supermarket. They find that the clothes stall that they meet on that market is cheaper than where they've been buying them at Asda or, or, or at um, New Look or wherever they might be shopping. Um, and so they start using them, their discretionary spend in the market instead of going back to the supermarket. So that's again, that's having that flow on effect for the economic benefit of the wider community it's mm. the vouchers aren't just going into the into the bellies of um you know making allowing families to access nutritious food to go into their bellies it's um putting money back into local economies which are in the poorest parts of the united kingdom so it's actually driving economic um vibrancy on of, of those communities at the same time which in the end because food poverty right is only a subset of poverty overall poverty so, so this project is also, um, I mean, I'm not claiming that we're solving poverty, right? But it's actually, it's putting money back into local economies. It's, it's, it's keeping small businesses, it's giving them extra income, which then flows on into their employees, the people that they pay. We also, during the pandemic, because markets, um, so the fruit and veg tr traders were allowed to keep trading because they were a essential food item, but all the rest of the market had to shut. So all of the incidental footfall that you would get from a fully operational market disappeared overnight. And we've had numerous traders tell us that if it hadn't been for the vouchers during that time, their business would have gone under. Yeah. So we know that we've made sure that people's businesses have been stabilized. We've made sure that local jobs and employment has been, has been, um, has been uh, safeguarded. Uh, and we hope as we scale that the economic impact of the project just becomes greater. Yeah. And, and, and given that um, the, the charity's mission is to, uh, to, to, to make a dent in diet related illness and, you know, to, to, to reverse those sort of root causes, what, when looking at the study, um, that's now in eight locations, I believe you, you, you named a few of them earlier. What, what are the specific outcomes that you are measuring to ensure that you are making good on that, on that mission? What, what kind of parameters are we looking at? Sure. So, I mean, I think the first thing, the first caveat is it's it's really hard to prove health um, oh, yeah. uh, changes from 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 diet alone. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, attribute attribution is very is very is very difficult. So, what we what we do know though is that there are really key indicators of improved nutritional quality. So, we really look for that improved um, uh, the evidence of that improved dietary quality. So we look at, of course, first and foremost, increased consumption of fruit and veg. So we measure, we do baseline surveys with families to find out how much they currently eat before they go on the program. And then we survey them six months later to see how their consumption is going at that point in time. We look at the range and diversity of, of food because one of the key 
things is that you need a div- diverse range of food. You know, you can't just eat, you know, if you just eat carrots and oranges and that's it, that's not going to necessarily um, give you the full range of nutrients that you need. So we look at um, diversity. Then we look at it, the impact on um, wider food behaviors. So what's your consumption of um, uh, snacks, unhealthy snacks, sweets, sh- um, sugary drinks at the start of the program? What's your consumption of those um, uh, food types after six months? We look at uh, um, cooking behaviors. So how many uh, uh, meals do you cook from scratch uh, uh, before and after? Um, how many takeaways are you eating before and after? And then we do qualitative um, workshops. And I suppose qualitative workshops is where the stories start to come out. So all of those are kind of indicators, but it's the stories that tell us um, whether it's actually having um, you know, noticeable health benefits. And so we always structure those workshops as really conversational. We don't lead them at all. Uh, we, um, we, we try and let um, people's stories come to the fore naturally. And we've been doing it for eight years. And I can tell you one clear story, which it just comes time and time again, and we never ask for it. It's not on any of our um, uh, evaluation forms, is around bowel health. So people will tell us, they'll, go, they'll start a conversation going, well, I feel lighter. And you go, oh, good, that's good. What do you mean lighter? Well, you know, I just feel... I feel I've got more energy and I've, I'm much lighter. And then, and then someone else will go, oh yeah, I, I feel that too. And, and then slowly it comes out, you know, I'm going to the toilet a lot more easily. And then someone will go, oh my God, yes, my son, and this, this has happened a number of times. My son, two-year-old son is, was on constipation medication, right? Can you imagine a two-year-old has to take medication for constipation? What's going on with their diet? And then they say, Six weeks after we started the Rose Voucher Project, he's no longer on the medication. So that that um, uh, feeling of of improved bowel health is a story we get time and time again, and that's a you know a key indication of higher um, fiber content in your diet, improving the your your um, uh, your, your your digestion system. Uh, so that's that's great, um, yeah. And we look for self-reported health and well-being, stress, anxiety, mental health, all of those re- reports because you know this is the challenge. And okay, we haven't even really touched on the cost of living crisis in our conversations yet today. But when you're on a low income, uh, life is incredibly stressful. You've got so many more concerns and worries and anxieties mm. than somebody who is well off because they, there is so much more to worry about. You know, if you're not sure how you're going to feed your kids when they come home from school today, that creates stress and anxiety. Now, just you, you take out all of the things that we put into our body, probably one of the biggest health de- determinants is stress and anxiety. The more, you know, the, your the more stress and anxiousness, anxiety that you have, the worse your health will be. Uh, and so we look for a direct correlation between we've given you some extra money to spend on food to, to ideally to make you healthier and happier, but now you're actually a little bit more financially secure. So other reports that come back is I now have money to spend on new shoes for my kids. I now have money to buy the book for school. I have the, all of those things are, I think are, are attendant health benefits from the project because I think poverty itself is a drag on people's health. Uh, and yeah, so that's, that's something that we see all the time reports of, uh, improved mental health, less anxiety, less stress. Yeah. I mean, thank you so much for sharing those stories. I mean, it, it is terrible to think about how many kids I've seen on constipation meds. In fact, I remember going to, um, uh, the Royal London, uh, pediatric department, they asked me to do like a, uh, a thing with, with some of their charity members about, uh, improving nutrition and uh, hydration amongst kids but also parents as well because obviously that has a knock-on effect um and there are plenty of children actually who uh, have a number of different bowel disorders uh, and constipation is certainly on the rise um so education around improving diversity the consumption the total consumption of fruit and vegetables super super important I wonder, looking at the, I'm assuming these are like fruit frequency questionnaires that you're using to measure these outcomes. Is that correct? So uh, w- with the pilots that you've done earlier, so the ones in like 2014, 2015, 
what were the results uh, on the the consumption diversity uh the health behavior their healthy behaviors like reduction of takeaways and stuff was that was that something that you saw a significant improvement uh, across across the board at six months yeah no totally i mean it, it's we've done it now uh, three or four times we've done uh, sort of in-depth evaluation of the program in, in the different locations. And, and of course, you know, 95% of people report increased consumption of fruit and veg. That goes without saying because we're increasing their, their access to fruit and veg. Um, but uh, uh, the, the statistics from, uh, from all of those other indicators, 75% of people are eating uh, more, cooking more meals from scratch, eating together, um, there's a reduction, a 65% reduction in snacks, unhealthy snacks, sweets, crisps, um, sugary drinks, uh, reduction in the amount of takeaways that people are eating. You know, it's been, it's, it's, it's hugely beneficial because, and, it, and that's not just our vouchers, right? And I can't take all the credit for that. It's the partnership that we have with those local centers and the engagement that they do with them on a week to week basis that says, okay, you've got the fruit and veg, yeah. but now, you know, why don't you come to the the baby weaning workshop where we can talk to you about what the foods that you're supposed to wean your child onto. Um, and how can we talk about, um, uh, why, why don't we give you some recipe cards because we've been working with the local dietetics team and there's these, you know, culturally tailored recipe cards that you can use. And when they get really lucky, and of course, funding's more of an issue these days, but we used to run many, many more, the, the centers, I'm sure, I'm sorry, used to run many, many more um, cook and eat workshops as well. Mm. They still go on, they're just not as frequent as they used to be because the funding is so uh, curtailed um, in, in, this, in the current climate. I mean, what's sad for me as a person who started working with um, with what were first called Sure Start Centres, so they they started under the Labour government in the in the two thousands, and then they transitioned into children's centres. But we spent, as a country, we spent billions building these centres. Um, there's there's buildings up and down the country, um, many of them very modern and, and beautiful. Uh, but since two thousand and ten, um, children's centres have lost fifty percent of their funding. And that many of them are struggling to offer those services. So, so when we started in 2014, that the level of service that was delivered from those centres was at a much higher level than it is now because the amount of money those centres have to spend on activities, engaging families, supporting families has just been cut so drastically. And it's it's a shame and it's very short sighted because it's it's that generation that will. You know, those are the ones who end up working and they are the ones who end up paying taxes that supports the, this generation in their older life. Um, but if they've got, you know, lower um, quality of health, they've got more sick days, they've got a shorter working life of, of healthy working life years because of long term health conditions that develop earlier, then we will all um, suffer the consequences. So it's it's really important that we invest in early years. Early years seems like this critical moment. Uh, I always say that, you know, it, as a country, we've spent a lot of time and energy and effort focused on um, looking at school food, which I think is incredibly important and and full credit to all those who've worked campaign tirelessly on school food. Um, you know, Jamie Oliver and 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 the Food Foundation and School Food Matters and all these great organisations. And, and by the way, just a shout out to the idea of providing universal free school meals to everyone, which I think is a, um, an idea whose, whose time has come. But the thing, the problem is, is that kids are already, uh, have already developed um, unhealthy food cultures, unhealthy food habits by the time they get to primary school. Um, there's n very little focus on early years nutrition and health uh, in, in, well, there's focus on early years health, there's a lot of focus on early years health, not a lot on early years nutrition. And I think we need to do more. And children's centres are and were a really fantastic resource to help drive those, um, drive programmes that could be really impactful in that sector. So yeah, I think we need to get our heads around, we need to, you know, as a country, and I mean, it's great to see um, the Princess of Wales, That's that seems to be where her focus is early years. She's, she's really campaigning um, voiceously on that issue. And I really hope she gets some traction because it's, um, I think we neglect it, especially cons compared to say our European counterparts where there's a much sort of broader focus on early years. Yeah. I think we can do better.
Yeah, I mean, what you mentioned at the start with the the first thousand days, I mean, that that's had a lot of attention, particularly uh, in those. I think it was Amsterdam, was it? If I'm remembering the uh, the study that was conducted on on the remote making very simple swaps to what kids were drinking and the effect on uh, obesity outcomes and all the rest of it. And I think generally there is a wider understanding and appreciation of the importance of um, prenatal nutrition, postpartum nutrition. Um, and uh, those those critical foundation years for for kids. Um, uh, it's interesting you mentioned the workshops because I think you're right. They need to go hand in hand. It's not as easy, uh, although I wish it was, just to give people better access and better availability of uh, fresh produce. You also need to teach them about how to use it. And uh, I'm not too sure if you know any stats about the number of people who lack kitchen facilities in their own home I, I i gather a lot of families just have microwaves and, and stuff is that something that you're 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 across as well yeah i mean this is the this is the terrible thing is that many families don't have the you know the the cooking equipment and kitchen set up that 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 you would be ideal for promoting a a, mm. you know, a better better nutrition and a better diet um a lot of families across the country are living in temporary accommodation and like you say that's all they've got is a microwave um, they don't have a hob they don't have an oven they don't have pots and pans because they're in temporary accommodation and these things aren't provided uh, it's it's a it's a real challenge we work with some refugee communities um, who are living in hotels um, and their food is provided for them by the hotel but it's it's mass produced and um, it's not culturally appropriate and what they've told us in, in a recent evaluation session, they just said, this is the voucher is so important because it's the only part of our food that we control, that we have power and agency over. So we can buy the cultural fruit and veg that, that we're used to from, from where they're from um, and, and they can do with it what they want to do with it. Although they don't have much cooking equipment, they can create what they can with the limited resources that they have. Um, so yeah, that's that's just the, the nature of um, some of the difficult and challenging situations that people are in. I mean, I do think I suppose I've got to say because it's a per, per personal bugbear of mine to a degree. I think people in low income communities they know they know what a healthy diet is, right? I think I think it's a misnomer to think that the poor just if they knew how to cook they would they would they wouldn't be in this situation. I think there are a wide range of skills out there and there's a good level of knowledge you know the most of the parents that i talk to they know that you know they need to eat more fruit and veg and they need to eat less sugary snacks and fizzy drinks and you know they've got they've got the good base understanding of what a healthy diet is but the challenges of 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 a of a difficult and stressful life in in poverty uh make things very very difficult i mean i i, I have this I, I often give the example when i get to fridays right oh quite a busy job it's quite tough running a charity that addresses food poverty and food insecurity during a covid and a cost of living crisis it's been a rough couple of years yeah i get to friday and on friday afternoon i go you know what? i'm just going to go down to that local shop and buy that chocolate brownie and then i get home on a friday and i honestly i, I hardly ever drink monday to friday I get home on a Friday. The first thing I want to do is crack a beer, all right. And that is it's habitual, and it's it's about comforting myself, and it's about um, it's about treating myself, but it's also about tiredness and and being run ragged by life. Um, but that's I only get that on by Friday, right? And that's my one day a week normally of feeling like that. Um, when you're living in poverty and you have the stress and anxiety of what you're going to do from day to day. That 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 urge just to feel like you can comfort yourself with something, or I'm going to eat that because I don't have to put any effort. You know, I'm running here, there, and everywhere to manage my family, working two or three jobs. I get home, I don't have time to cook. I can just chuck that in the microwave or in the oven, and and it'll fill everyone up. And my kid will turn around to me and say, "Thanks, mum. Thanks, dad. That was delicious." Of course, it makes sense. That's the choice I'm going to make and it's cheaper mm. right so it's 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 it, it really they're in a very difficult bind but by giving them a little bit of financial support through the vouchers 
giving them the, you know, so suddenly you've got this fruit and veg in the house. So you've got to do something with it. You've got to eat it. You've got to try. It gives you the impetus to go, actually, I might put a bit of effort in and, and make something from scratch for the kids tonight. Um, we, we had, we held a, um, a really nice, um, uh, a visit by a director of public health from, uh, Lam uh, from Southwark council and, uh, the cabinet member for, um, for health and adult social care in Lambeth as well. And they, uh, Southwark, and they came to, um, the center. And of course we wanted to put on a bit of a show. So I'd ask the center, you know, make sure that there's some families there to talk to and, um, and, you know, get, book us a room so we can have space to talk. And I arrived and the families were there, uh, and, but one family arrived late and the woman has a disability. So she had driven and, um, and I saw her walk in and the kid had a bag of crisps in the, in the buggy. And it was like, oh. and, um, and, and anyway, then we're all talking and everyone's sharing their stories and there's some really beautiful stories coming out. And then the, and then the, 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 the this, suddenly I realized this kid was sitting on the floor with a Satsuma and eating it. And, uh, and she said, you know, I drove here and, um, and he was in the back of the car and he started, you know, getting really upset and angsty and I was in a rush. So I, I grabbed a piece, a packet of crisps from the front seat and I chucked it over the back to him and he mm -hmm. sat in the back seat and it calmed him, quieted him down. And he came in the buggy through the, this door. And as soon as he, uh, got here, he handed me the crisps and he went straight for that Satsuma and the director of public health said, yeah, I saw him do that. I saw him do that. And she said, and she said, I've got an older son who's nine years old. He was never part of this project. He would never do that. He said, my, this one, this one is a veg and fruit and veg advocate. He advocates for fruit and veg. He asked me, where's the fruit and veg in the snack or in this meal? He talks about fruit and veg all the time. My older son never does because he never had access to this project. And I turned to the director of public health and said, by the way, I didn't pay this kid to do that, right? <laughs> it had nothing to do with me. He did that all on his own. If I, if I, if I could have paid him to do something like that, I, I, would, I would pay him every day of the week, but he, he didn't. He just did it all on his own. And that just shows you the power of access, of, of, of changing what happens week to week in your diet just changes your predilection predilection for what you what your taste buds what what you sense and of course you still like sweets and chocolates and crisps we, we all do that they're, they're you know they're beautifully designed to appeal to our palates right but once you've gorged yourself on that as somebody like myself and probably like yourself who are into health mm -hmm. and into well-being you know you just start to cry oh, i love an art fresh cut up a fresh orange or a crunchy carrot or a red pepper you know you feel like that but if you mm. if you haven't been opened to those experiences, if you hadn't had that as part of regularity, you you're not going to demand it. Yeah, yeah. That kid demands it. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, that's such a touching story. I mean, I mean, we haven't really touched uh, on, on your story and your background uh, uh, as much as we should do, Jonathan. I, I'm really intrigued to to hear about your thoughts about you know whether you get frustrated. I mean, you're literally fighting a battle against companies that invest literally hundreds of millions of pounds and dollars globally to not only produce food that is hyper palatable and literally addictive, but also marketed to be really fashionable. I mean, particularly amongst YouTubers, you know, we have uh, uh, you know, Doritos is always plastered all over uh, all over my YouTube. Uh, I know I could I could name a string of other sort of confectionery items that again are, are targeted at the youth of today via means that are always evading government controls, and so it seems a bit pervasive, you know, to for 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 kids at such an impressionable age to sort of gear them to all the things that you know probably me and you grew up with. I mean, I'm not too sure we we grew up, but in, in me growing up in the UK, I can name all the sweets i can name all the crisp packets i can name all those like wonderful items that like remind me of my childhood and luckily i evaded that sort of um the pull of of uh processed foods in my in my 20s but for a lot of other people that's just not the case and i can enjoy them at a distance rather than being something that is my daily staple so i mean how did you get into this and and, and what are your thoughts on sort of the the bigger picture and uh, of our of our food landscape yeah, sure. So, I mean, so as you picked up and, you, you know, people listening to this will probably tell, um, I'm not from the UK. I, I was born in New Zealand and I grew up there uh, until the age of 28 before I came over here. So I've been here ex exactly 20 years uh, this year, actually. 
Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think I was very fortunate growing up. Um, I had a uh, I had parents who were very adventurous, but also I, I, I grew up at a moment where New Zealand opened to the world. So New Zealand was quite a closed little country up until the 1980s. Uh, and and meat and three veg that was it you know like you just had you had your real staples you ate a lot of lamb you ate a lot of um roast dinners you had very um very plain food and the government controlled it very strongly actually um you know the dairy industry was very powerful so in the 1970s you had to have a prescription from your doctor to get margarine because oh, wow. they just did not want to let people have access to margarine so it, it was it was a prescribed product um and in the 1980s, we, we massively liberalized our economy uh, and, uh, and New Zealanders flew the coop as well a lot. They, they traveled around the world. And um, as I was growing up, that generation who'd traveled the world started bringing back food um, uh, and, uh, and, and this sort of uh, cuisine, well, this, this food from around the world. Suddenly, you know, you, you would go into a shop and you'd find hummus and you'd be like what is hummus and what is falafel and what is you know and 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 sushi and but it just boomed and it was it was very surprising to me when I came to the UK in in 2002 actually I thought apart from London London is an incredible sort of diverse um, food culture but the rest of the UK I found the food culture really um, lacked diversity and lacked um, uh, inspiration I was I was really shocked and that's something that's changed quite massively over those 20 years. I, I see much more uh, uh, diverse food culture ev everywhere I go in the UK. But New Zealand went through a sort of blossoming period. And I think um, I benefited from that because my parents were very open minded about the world and started bringing things home. And, you know, I remember them bringing avocados home for the first time and going, what, what is this? What is this <laughs> avocado? Um, and, uh, and croissants and, you know, just funny things that you just take for granted now but it was all new and then in my uh, in my 20s i think you know you 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 very open to the to wider world and my friends started exploring issues around food i had friends who became vegetarian i had friends who became vegans um i became really interested in the politics behind food that's what really got me it suddenly mm. st struck me that there was this political undertone to our food system. Uh, and I, I became very interested in it. I thought about um, regenerative agriculture, organics, sustainability. Uh, and, and when I came to study at university, I, 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 I sort of looked at the global political economy of agriculture. And I said, there's something, there's a dominant system here that's not working for, for the planet or for the health of people. Uh, and I wanted to see, uh, I wanted to look at the uh, a microcosm of the global political economy in New Zealand. And I wanted to look at what would be possibly a healthy green alternative to that. So I, I looked at the New Zealand dairy industry, which um, following that deregulation that I talked about in the 1980s, New Zealand is famous for its sheep, right? Everyone talks about how many sheep there were. Well, there used to be 60 million sheep and 3 million people. That's the, that's the story we all grew up with. Well, actually, after liberalization, all of that, a large swathe of that sheep farming became unprofitable because it was all subsidized by the government and they dropped all of those subsidies. So the sheep farmers, a lot of them went out of business. Um, and then the invisible hand of the market started to play its part and people went, well, actually the thing that makes more money per hectare um, and is easier to do is, um, is dairy and producing dairy products to sell to the world. And there was a bigger appetite at that time, you know, places like Asia, China, Indonesia, um, were all opening up their um, uh, dietary needs and dairy was becoming a bigger part of that. Uh, and so, the New Zealand dairy industry di uh, diversified and grew at a massive scale. And so when I wrote my dissertation in 1998, uh, well, no, more to, like around 2000, 
um, the dairy industry uh, was the major cause of pollution in New Zealand's riverway. It was leaching nitrates into the soil. Um, it was um, it was the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases, uh, and it was it was it was the thing that was damaging New Zealand's environment and actually ruining its clean green image, which it loves to sell to the rest of the world, but sometimes it's not exactly the reality. Uh, and so I wrote about that, and then I looked at um, sort of local what I thought were like a wonderful small microcosm of an alternative way of doing things. Um, very, very uh, uh, rose tinted glasses view of the world uh, as you do when you're younger. Um, and I looked at uh, community gardens in my hometown in Christchurch and looked at how they drew in community, worked with people, grew healthy food, did it sustainably, did it locally. And I thought, you know, why can't the food global food system the dominant political economy of the food system be replaced by this beautiful, lovely, um, uh, wistful, um, uh, yes, rose tinted glasses view of of community gardens in my hometown of Christchurch, and um, and it just fascinated me that whole writing, that whole research, looking at it from from a global perspective, looking at the history of our agricultural production. I mean, the, this fascinating thing is that we're only been agriculturalists for ten thousand years, mm. right? Yeah. It's a really recent thing. And what I love, like agriculture is the, the, the two words, like it's culture. The way you produce food, your relationship to product, where you source food, the production of it is your culture. Mm. It's agriculture. And so the way that we produce food at the moment is shaping our culture and shaping it not necessarily in the healthiest and definitely not in the most sustainable way. So I suppose that comes to another area that we're, we're really focused on, um, which is the biggest challenge, I think, that we that we face. We're, we're partners on a national program called um, Bridging the Gap. Uh, and when when we first set the program up, what we did in Hackney was we partnered with a really fantastic organization called Growing Communities, which mm. is a um, organic farmers market in um, Hackney been running for over 20 years M amazing organization um, as well as Ridley Road and we thought well we'll give people a choice about where to redeem their vouchers and you know surprise surprise people chose Ridley Road because it was more culturally appropriate more diverse and and more affordable but the aim has always been well no my desire has always been how do you how do you square that circle if you like how do you how do you make good healthy food that is both good for your for the for the people but good for the planet so climate and nature friendly food accessible to people on low incomes and so this national program called bridging the gap is a partnership with us and sustain the alliance for better food and farming and growing communities to look at what is what is the fine what are the financial mechanisms mechanisms that you could that you could um, put into play to help bridge that gap between climate and nature friendly food and people who need access to good food right now uh, and you know it's it's just quite the strange dynamic that we have in the uk you've got sort of almost two very dynamic parts of the food sector you've got loads of people on one side hugely focused and motivated to feed people in poverty who are suffering from food insecurity right now so the, the 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 mushrooming of food banks across the country the the plethora of food surplus food um interventions that you can see um in the uk today fantastic um organizations providing a really important emergency service but not necessarily um with uh, with a focus primarily on 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 good nutrition it's just about making sure that people get fed which at the moment is incredibly important, right? And then on the other side, you've got this middle higher income uh, community who are really passionate about good, local, sustainable food, pr food provenance and, and sustainability. But the price of that food is really, really high. It's been enjoyed by a very small niche um, and, and it's, it's very yeah, it's very middle class or even upper middle class because it's it's it because of that niche and expensiveness. Um, but it's a very dynamic piece area of work, and there's some fast, fantastic stuff going on there. How do you? Because the challenge is right. We're facing a climate and nature emergency, and uh, and the food system plays a huge part in that in that problem. And 
most of the world's population are actually on low incomes, right? So if we can't create a food system whereby climate nature friendly food are available to the majority of people, then we we won't we will fail in addressing one of the key root causes of climate change. Mm. So we've got to come up with a way of making climate nature friendly food accessible um, to to people on low incomes. And for me, you know, for the the history of food is a history of subsidies and government interventions. Um, And it can be direct subsidies, it can be indirect subsidies, um, but we have always interfered financially with our food system um, to make sure that it works for for what what our main goals and outcomes are. And that's why we created food subsidies. It's why we had um, food uh, food stamps during the war and and rationing. We had food rationing, sorry, during the war that went on right up until the 50s. Um, because, you know, when you need to prioritise your food system, the government needs to intervene. And so what we're trying to do with Bridging the Gap is is to show what type of financial mechanisms could work to make that food, climate nature-friendly food, accessible to all. And one way, we think, is you put the financial incentive, rather than subsidising farmers directly, you put the subsidies in the hands of consumers but that subsidy can only be spent on climate and nature friendly food. So we're looking at ways of piloting at that. So that might be a classic rose vouchers for fruit and veg project mm. in partnership with the farmer's market in an area which is a food desert. But yeah. if we bring the market to that area, give the vouchers to the to the community, then they can start affording that that food. That farmer and that farmer's market gets the income that then goes back into the farm and increases production, increases the financial viability of that um, of that enterprise. Yeah. So that's really exciting. Um, it's, it's still in its infancy. Uh, we we only we only secured the funding around June this year, um, but we're we're developing ideas. We're looking for people who come who've got some bright ideas to come forward and partner with us. Um, so yeah, if any of your listeners are interested that, that um, sustain the Alliance for Better Food and Farming, the people to get in touch with, and, and bridging the gap is the name of the project. That that, that sounds epic, and I've uh, I've been chatting to Thomasina Mines actually about her um, plans around regenerative farming uh, and how to encourage uh, governments to adopt uh, organic produce as part of public sector. Uh, procurement so the ingredients banks and stuff and you know ensuring that whatever our spend is a certain part of that is ring fenced for these particular farms that have climate at, as one of the pillars in which they produce food so and i agree with your sentiment about you know the history of food and it being a collection of subsidies uh that are geared towards our sort of common goal you know i think before it was protective and more sort of like domestic economy and now it can be geared towards other grander um uh, ideas around climate change it, it's interesting um especially especially now we're talking about the cost of living crisis i interviewed um professor guy standing uh a, a couple of years ago uh, he's a huge proponent of universal basic income and i proposed this idea of why i thought fresh food uh healthy food should be free um He actually pushed back uh, quite a bit. He said from his experience in doing these tests, these infill tests, uh, it comes back to that idea that you mentioned earlier about your locus of control, your feeling of control. And his idea was actually instead of giving uh, uh, vouchers that have um, a, a, a sort of mechanism around them, sort of limitations on where and what you can spend on, uh, encourages more of that sort of feeling that gives people less stress, less anxiety in, in conditions, particularly of uh, f- financial deprivation. I wonder how you would, would sort of tackle that pushback if, if maybe Guy said that to you about the, the, the healthy food scheme and the voucher scheme that you have. What, what, what kind of ways in which do you, would you push back against that idea? I mean, first of all, I, you know, I just need to say, I think universal basic income is a fantastic idea. Mm. I think the, the, the challenge that we have around um, diet and nutrition, I think a lot of things would need to change within the food system to make universal basic income the, the thing that would solve our, our diet-related ill health and uh, 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 um, problems that we're facing and the climate and nature emergency. 
at the moment giving more giving people more money is really important and i i you know i would encourage the government to you know i'm really glad that they're going to uplift benefits uh, in line with inflation uh um uh, i was very disappointed when they took the 20 pounds uh in a uh, lift uh, uh, uplift out of universal credit last year um i think people do need more money it's really important um uh, but at the moment we have a food system like i said where the the unhealthy food is three times cheaper than the healthy food. So even if you give people more money, there will always be people that will find themselves in financial difficulties or where money is squeezed. And the thing with food is that it's one of the very few um, uh, areas of your budget that has elasticity, right? So the rent, the rent has to be paid. The power company, the power company has to be paid. Food, you can you can skip a meal, you can you can trade down, you can go, well, I'll go for this cheaper stuff rather than the stuff that I really like. Um, you, there's so many ways of, of elasticity within your within the budget for food. And so what would happen if we had universal basic income, but still had the food system that we currently have, is that people would con continue to make a rational economic decision, which is to purchase the stuff that's cheap and easily available mm. um, to, to, to fill them themselves up to make their kids happy and satiated um, and uh, and unless our food culture has changed we would still have the same diet um, related ill health problems so I would argue that at the moment these vouchers these are all about incentivizing a change to our food culture mm -hmm. where good food becomes the norm where good feed food retail where diverse retail economies become the norm and once we've got that Sure, I, Alexander Rose Charity. We can we can walk away and say job done, and we can move on to our next program or disband or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, I'd be really be wonderful to be in a place where we didn't didn't need um, uh, financial incentives for fruit and veg um, to 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 support communities. And and that's this amazing world. This almost goes back to my you know my youthful university studies where we live in these in this utopian food culture almost those blue zones they always talk about those blue zones don't they where you know where everyone eats lovely fruit and veg and fresh fish and uh, but only small amounts of good quality protein you know when the uk does that then of course universal basic income will be the will be the thing that's that stops poverty and um, and it won't matter that um, there's there's not vouchers for fruit and veg because the food culture of the country will be a completely different one. Yeah. But that ain't going to happen soon or quickly or easily. And what we need is a financial incentive to try and turn this oil tanker around of our food system to find it to, to financially incentivize it to go in a different way. Yeah, um, I, and and I think I think that putting the money, I think what's great, and you go back to your 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 academic whose name I've forgotten, um, but go back to him and say that um, that this is going to be a great interim step for universal basic income because it is giving people more money. This is the bank of Alexander Rose charity going directly to people's pockets, but it's incentivizing a change in our food system that we definitely need to have happen, and to uh, so that when universal basic income finally comes. That it will that it will won't have any detrimental effect on um, people's um, uh, yeah. diet. Yeah, or definitely. that that won't be having the effect on the diet. The food system and the food culture will still be having the impact on their diet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think that that idea of food elasticity is a really important concept that listeners should take take away because I think the way you frame that makes makes total sense. And I should have some roundtables with people who are generally forward thinking and thinking in the same direction, but might have nuances within their perspective. Uh, when we start filming the pod again in, in the studios, uh, I'd love to invite you on and, and uh, get you to chat to Professor Guy Sanning and a few other people from different perspectives, actually, because I think this this area is just so so interesting and, and discussion around it is, um, is really needed. I, I want to bring our conversation to a close, although I feel like I chat to you for ages about you know New Zealand and your and your background your 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 dissertations and stuff it's, it's fascinating um one of the with the with the current um study that's going on do you I mean it might be quite early but do you have any early sort of indications of what the outcomes are from 
uh, giving these uh, vouchers to how, how many look at it? eight locations and how many families are involved in this study? So, so we have two programs. We have our early years program and we have our fruit and veg on prescription program. So gotcha. the early years program operates in eight, eight centers across the UK and fruit and veg on prescription is operating in two areas, um, Lambeth and Tower Hamlets. Gotcha. So we're, it's very small and early days. Um, it's uh, 120 uh, um, recipients to begin with, uh, 60 um, in each area. We're working with the Bromley by Bow Centre in Tower Hamlets, who are, um, I would say, one of the most brilliant um, yeah. medical um, community health centres in the UK, have yeah. been trailblazing for 30 years. Uh, and and they're also at the forefront of the social prescribing movement uh, and social prescribing is really interesting because it's it's actually has you know a full-hearted support from central government and and department of health uh, and it's all about recognizing that the that there are wider determinants to people's health and well-being than just what the doctor can prescribe uh, and so social prescribers the, the doctor might give you something for your ailment but the doctor will say you know you could benefit because your ailment is related to your lifestyle to your environment to your situation you might benefit from um, engaging with our social prescribers who can help you with issues like housing debt advice income maximization uh, and now they can say access to healthy food and so you can go along and get all of that support and get a, a prescription for fruit and veg, one of our vouchers to take down to the local market. You will also be able to access, you know, you might be referred to a, a gardening club, a cooking workshop um, and, and other sort of stuff. You have recipe cards and all of those things. And those sessions that you get with social prescriber will all be about prompting and supporting you to make the changes that, that you need. I suppose it's worth saying that the model is slightly different than early years. So we are, we're doing, we're testing at two levels and this is based on feedback from our local partners about what you could purchase at the market for the value of the voucher. So in Lambeth, we're basing it on eight pounds per week for the, for the recipient. If they have another member of, of, uh, of their household, they get two extra vouchers for each. Um, member of household. So if they had, uh, if that was them and two others, they would get a, a total of 12 vouchers. And in Tower Hamlets, it's starting point is six and two extra for every other member of the family. Um, they are in, in Lambeth, we're working with a fantastic um, uh, community health outreach program called the Beacon Project. And the Beacon Project uh, was set up uh, during COVID, actually, they started, they, they were set up before then, but they were focused on international health work. And now they've started to look more in their community in South London. And they realized that there are huge swathes of that community that are a little bit um, uh, reluctant to go and see um, medical establishment. They don't present, they don't go see their GP very often. They don't, they're a bit suspicious. They don't, they're not um, inclined to engage with the medical profession until something is really wrong and then they're they're presenting with an emergency so what they do is they take doctors and nurses out to the community rather than expecting the community to come into the gp practice so they they've got some fa fantastic outreach programs in lambeth one is in a church near brixton market there's one in a place called community shop uh, in west norwood and on stretton high street they um they work out of a barber shop so, you know, people come to the barber shop and they come to get their hair cut. And of course, in South London, you come to chat, right? You come to sit yeah. around and have a good chin wag. And then, and then there's the doctor sitting there going, hey, do you want me to do your blood pressure? Should we have a chat about? And, and so they, they are terrific. They, they just get out with, and they, they just stop people in the streets. They'll stand outside and they'll stop people in the street and say, come in, let's do your blood pressure. Let's have a chat about your health. So there, there are other partners. Um, so we're really excited because it's quite different approaches. Bromley by Bo, very traditional, very innovative, but very traditional medical practice, community health centre, and then the Beacon Project, getting out into communities, outreach work, um, you know, location-based health practice, which is really cool. That's amazing. Uh, and That's like guerrilla healthcare. I love it. <laughs> it is. It is like guerrilla healthcare. <laughs> they, they're really terrific. And... Um, yeah, when you see them in action, they just they have they they are such 
they, they've just got such a brilliant way of engaging people. They don't take no for an answer. They'll talk, you know, they'll, they'll talk your ear off before they even say, by the way, I'm a doctor, would you like, or I'm a nurse, would you like to come and get your, your blood pressure done? And by that time, you're already sucked in and you, you can't yeah, stop Yeah, totally. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing food frequency diaries. We're doing, um, uh, you know, baseline surveys, and, and then we'll be reporting in six months. Of course, we, we know we're nearly three months in. We're already getting some anecdotal um, feedback coming. You know, people are very happy with the project. We had one of my colleagues was uh, at the distribution in West Norwood. People were hugging her. People were, you know, literally, you know, they were so grateful for, for receiving this extra money, really, to be able to buy food. Because these are people who are who are very food insecure, um, and uh, but it's it's allowing them. To, it's, I was on Brixton Market yesterday with one of the participants. We did a piece for BBC London News, and I was talking to her, and she just said, "You know, I, it just allows me to uh, experiment. You know, I don't know what some of this stuff is, but I would never buy it because I don't want to risk not liking mm. it. I don't want to risk cooking it or not knowing how to cook it. But now I can experiment. I can ask the trader, what's that?" How do I cook this? Let's give it a go because it's not my money at risk here. It's some money, extra money that I got given. And that's the thing. I mean, we do that. This, this comes back in our early years program. My daughter, she uh, she's 10 now, but when she was little, she um, she was very fussy eater. And, um, and you'd put something like broccoli on her plate. And she, at two years old, she'd grab it, fling it across the room and say, disgusting. And, you know, I was always very proud at her wonderful voca vocabulary development at an early age. I was like, that's pretty good. But I was very disappointed with her, with her, um, you know, her reluctance to try new things. Now, that's fine. You know, that's on the floor now. Um, three second rule, I'll put it in my mouth or it goes in the bin. But um, I, I, I can risk that, right? I can take those risks. I can try a different type of edge. She, Turns out she loves cauliflower, hates broccoli, right? So I just ply, plow, you know, put broccoli, uh, cauliflower on her plate all the time and she'll eat that. But if you don't have the financial um, capacity to keep experimenting, to keep testing out, and there is, I don't, I, I, I'll get the statistic wrong, but there is this, this, there is evidence base that says you have to try something new like six times before your, your palate adjusts to a new taste or texture, before it becomes acceptable to you, right? So when you're a kid, you've got to be able to have, you know, and you will all, well, most parents will have had this experience, experience, like their kid will love something for ages and they just want it all the time and then they'll go off it and they'll never eat it for the rest of their life. They don't like it anymore, yeah. but they'll do the opposite. They'll like, I don't like that, don't like that, don't like that. And then one day they'll go, they'll have it and they'll or they'll be at a friend's house right because this is the thing they don't eat it in front of you but they go to a friend's house and somebody else gives it puts it on their plate they eat it then they come back and go you know dad can i have some red pepper please because that uh, when did you start liking red pepper oh ethan's mum gave me this lovely dish the other night blah 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 and it's like oh okay there you go you need to there's a certain threshold point that they get to after being exposed to it for a certain amount of time the vouchers give you the ability to keep experimenting with your kids, keep trying something new out. Because the sad thing is, is that it probably doesn't take six times for you to bite into a chicken nugget and go, I like that, mm. right? So you've done it once, you liked it, and the mum goes or the dad goes, you know what? I know they like it. I know they'll eat it all. There won't be any food waste. They'll turn around to me and say, dad, thanks. That was delicious. And as a parent, that's all you want, right? Mm, That's all you yeah. want. You want that reaction and you want your kids to be full, satiated and happy. And so that becomes the easy option. And it's, again, going back to what we've said so many times, it's pretty cheap. Yeah. It's really available. Every shop I go into, I can buy chicken nuggets. Every shop. Yeah. yeah without fail. Totally. totally. Well, I mean, I'll be, I'll be looking out for the results of... Um, of this study in uh, in, in three or f uh, four months time i'm fascinated by you know the pilot stuff that you've done already um you know i just find it interesting there's a bunch of tech companies doing some you know weird and wonderful stuff personalizing diets and doing all these tests and stuff and then essentially recommending what is a healthy diet with increased fruit and vegetables increased fiber 
Um, I don't think it needs to be as complicated as we want it to be. Uh, and almost similar outcomes to your pilots, you know, improved energy, improved uh, bowel habit, improved consumption of a variety and diversity of, of these ingredients. I, I truly believe like the, the science is complicated around nutrition. The solution is simple, but the implementation, that's the hard bit. And I think, you know, what you're doing with the charity and with the vouchers, you're really dialing down to that implementation bit. And I think that's where we need to focus a lot of our efforts. Um, and, you know, companies raising like hundreds of millions to do essentially what you're doing. I just really wish that money would just go straight to you guys uh, and your fund it. So I, I really do hope this is a, a stellar success. And uh, and we as GPs can start prescribing fruit and vegetables in the NHS. I think it's just it's got to happen. It's just it's so needed. Yeah. Well, if you ever come across any of those uh, tech investors who are about to throw <laughs> their money in the direction, and please, please do divert it our way. I'll be, I'll be eternally grateful. Epic, of course. Thank you so much, Jonathan. This has been a pleasure, and I'm sure right. this won't be the last time. I'd love to to keep in contact and uh, and see if I can help in any other way. And uh, and uh, yeah, we'll have to do this again uh, at the end and, and go through the results. Excellent. No, I'd I'd really welcome that. And yeah, it'd be really nice talking to you. It's nice and easy and fun. So thanks very much. Rick. Epic, epic. <laughs>